first is Anonymous, who was uh, active in 2012, who lived in the age when who wants to uh, when the ancient um, literature is uh, trying to get embedded into the texture of um, uh, the court history. Anonymous's Gastanorum doesn't even mention the word hon, but he still thinks that they are the same. Attila, who is mentioned more than 20 times in his work, is put into the genealogy of Hungarian princes and Almos's uh, uh, occurrence in the Carpathian Basin is like the justification of the Hungarian conquest in line with Attila's uh, uh, duties. Simon Kézai, who also wrote Gesta Hunga Rorum, uh, between 1282 and 1285, uh, the uh, chapters very well express uh, his intention uh, the things that Huns do, and the second is about the return. Here he discusses the story of uh, Hungarians led by Attila and led by Arpad. Although he considers this as the first influx or the second influx, he also interconnects the two that the Huns are identified especially with the Hungarians, whereas Huns and Hungarians are considered to be sisters and brothers. Kezai's Gesta was used by the Pictorial Chronicle uh, and the Buddha Chronicle as well, keeping uh, the structure of a double uh, conquest of the Hungarian bases. So it's the first the Huns moving in and the Hungarian moving in. He mentions that the first and the second coming in of the Hungarians. These are very well discussed from the period of Arpa's conquest up to the period of the death of Saint Stephen. Attila is actually depicted in quite a blurred manner, but uh, it is kind of merging the various information coming from various places and sources. And this is how it is all embedded into the genealogy of the Hungarian ruling uh, uh, family. Anonymous is uh, ignorance to a certain extent um, uh, raises two questions. One is, whose traditions we can talk about here. And the second is, where does this tradition come from? To whom and whose tradition it is refers to the fact that the descendants uh, from Attila, it is just the tradition of the ruling um, clan, or is it uh, uh, just a piece of literature, or is this really the origin of the Hungarians? So where does this tradition come from? Those who think that this belongs to the dynasty, or if they think that they think that both are conceivable, they think that the Hungarian's identity concept came from the East together with the nation of Arpad. Contrary, though, those who uh, re Jacked Attila's uh, Attila's um, relationship. They think that the Hungarian Attila tradition has a lot of elements that show that the very well-known legends connected to Attila are coming actually from the steppe region. The Han-Hungarian relationships identity uh, originated uh, in the 19th century, but with, from a different angle. It is uh, obvious that the thought is present uh, in Anonymous's ideas, but uh, the 70 years that passed between Anonymous and Kezai, the written tradition, uh, the written tradition actually was uh, elaborated. So they were started to research whether this Hon tradition could come from Europe. Uh, the very thorough philological examinations uh, prove that each and every authors in Hungary embedded their learned knowledge into these uh, pieces of uh, 
literature, but the Scythians and Huns related classic readings and the rumors of the news from the West are reflected in these books. Uh, with regard to the Huns, when this, when this, uh, when did this exactly happen? Well, this is the transposition of the sources from the West, fr starting from anonymous. But what was the tangible reason for this? Well, so far, no substantial explanation was g given. Uh, there were some Hun related. Uh, uh, tales and stories, but it lost its uh, contents uh, during the couple of hundreds of years. And in order to, to replace the contents, they used some Western information. These two uh, uh, mindset and these two attitudes are contradicting each other. It is actually the fact that from the Hungarian uh, pieces of literature that we uh, get from the 19th century, from that we can actually uh, point out that this is uh, uh, the uh, that the relationship existed uh, you cannot presume that anonymous uh, actually shocked his contemporaries with the theory of the hungarian relationship but out of the hungarians he was the one who in a, the most thorough way collected all the nine uh, notes uh, that he took in the 13th century, and as a result of that, he came to the conclusion that European sources at the very beginning uh, from the real uh, ignorance or because of the very similarity of the Hungarian nation, consider that the two nations were similar at the beginning only rarely, but as time was progressing, a uh, development process can be indicated in, uh, can be detected in the Western uh, sources in which they considered the Huns and the Hungarians identical, and probably this all originated from Hungary because Western sources put together put the two nations next to each other. However, they do not attach any theory as such, and they do not um, uh, envisage to do anything like that. So this can only be derived from the Hungarian sources. So where does this kind of origin get into the Hungarian sources? Um, it is the age of anonymous uh, in the 1200s. This is something that we can get take for granted, but can we go way beyond in the traditional historiography? Lately, such a position is being developed, which means that the existence of the knowledge of the of, of the Huns can uh, trace back to the 11th century. But if that was only a kind of verbal tradition that was uh, handed down by word of mouth, well, this is not known. But it is quite uh, the situation is made quite difficult that the first uh, intact work uh, is done by anonymous. The Arpad dynasty's various time layers identification and everything that the philological examination was uh, was was doing well. This is not an easy thing to do. We cannot tell quite easily as to when the first uh, chronicle was noted and what was the content. Some people think that it was the mid 11th century, Andras the first, when the ancient gesta was made. But some, they only say it. It was half a century later. It was raised that. Uh, out of the Western notes, the Hun and Hungarian identities, knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable information can be put in as well. And the further question is, if that was the case, could that mean any uh, Attila or Hunic uh, tradition? So the examination so far were concentrating on the traditional version and by comparing the various texts, they try to compare the um, contents. But in addition to the ancient Gesta, there could be some other uh, notes uh, made by historians. But in the research, it seems that it is necessary 
to involve uh, the list of the kings and the annuals. Barnett Holman already pointed out that the Somoit County annual books or the Zagrab and Varad Chronicle includes uh, the traditions about the relationship between the Huns and the Hungarians, about all the three documents. It turned out that although they were made later, but they dated, they were backdated and leave a lot of uh, important information for us. Later, however, uh, this continued in the 15th to 16th century codexes and uh, um, the reading and exploring this and, and examining this continued. From this, it has also uh, turned out that some of the data are made more precise uh, and sometimes even going back to very early periods. The Hun uh, tradition, which is implied in them, just as it happened in the case of the Chronicle, has not been conducted as yet. Later, uh, the, uh, uh, it is not going to bring anything new in the question of the Han-Hungarian relationship. It is only uh, the complex analysis of all the texts that come to this, uh, um, to the to the insight of the historians, and it is only a very thorough uh, study that will allow that the current um, uh, research results would move away from the cul-de-sac where they are now. Thank you very much for the presentation by Eva Teisler, who is uh, who was talking about the reflection of uh, the traditions of historiography. And now, from here onwards, let us uh, talk about the contemporary topics about the uh, techniques of uh, uh, the Mongolian bow. First, we will talk about the Mongolian bow. And I'm asking uh, Nasan uh, Ochi Erdene Ohir uh, to deliver his presentation titled Origin and Development of the Mongolian Bow. За <laughs> За энэ хүү нөмн археологийн судалгаагаар хөрөл зүсхийн үед Монгол нутагт үүссэн байх магадлал бол маш өндөртэй байгаа. За ингээд Чингисийн сэргүүдийн одоо гарт очтлоо. Багда 1600 жилийг одоо туулсан ийм одоо түүхэн зэвсэг байна. За тэгээ өнөөдөр бол Монголд энэ Монгол номыг өнөөдрийг хүртэл одоо ашиглаж хэрэгжилж спорт тэмцээнд development of hundreds of years now um, we have uh, uh, this bow um, in the hands of uh, the Hans. And uh, as far as I know, uh, you uh, know uh, this type of bow also in Hungary, which is rather complex, and it's made of wood. So my research is on the bows of Genghis Khan soldiers, uh, what uh, uh, had been the development until it got into the hands of the Mongolian soldiers. In Mongolia, uh, it is the Neolith age uh, from where we have got relics uh, uh, of these uh, arrows. And until uh, so at the time when the current uh, climate set in, uh, we already had uh, the contemporary smaller 
animals, and that is why uh, humanity had to come up uh, with a weapon which was faster uh, and had a long range. How can we prove uh, this? Where we uh, usually find uh, tips uh, of um, arrows. And we've got a lot of uh, uh, drawings in the Altai um, uh, mountain. And uh, some are also uh, registered as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And here in these uh, uh, pictures, uh, you can uh, see different drawings uh, of bows. And we are uh, having these from the late Bronze Age. And you can now see how often uh, this weapon was used in the late Bronze Age. And uh, this uh, uh, is already the remnants of the uh, bows. Uh, from the late Bronze Age, from uh, Mongolia, Orbo, uh, Egal, and from the Dorochin grave. And you can see the uh, photo uh, in uh, the um, uh, on the screen. So that's where this uh, was found. And. Um, uh, so there are vaults uh, made uh, by putting big stones on each other. And from these vaults, uh, we excavate uh, uh, fragments of bones. And also from this, range, uh, from this region, um, we surfaced uh, these tips of uh, uh, arrows. And that's how the researchers can see that uh, uh, these uh, rectangular uh, Words. represent a time when at the uh, tips of the arrows uh, they um, uh, had uh, ornamental bones and at the handle also at the arms uh, these bones were also used on these parts and probably also they had a function to reinforce the structure. And in the area of uh, Mongolia and as a Scythian heritage, uh, uh, we've managed to find uh, lots of bows. And from the uh, Basilike uh, heritage, we only have got the remnants of uh, one single arrow. And this is what you can see here. And you can see that uh, uh, this uh, uh, is a bow which is quite complex and uh, it's glued together. Although in Russia, it was thought uh, that uh, the bow uh, comprised three things, um, uh, the wood, the bone, and uh, uh, the tendon, and they had to uh, glue them together, and that's how bows were manufactured. And the next important era is the Hanik uh, era, and from the current Mongolian uh, territory, uh, we found here lots uh, of uh, uh, graves of the elite and of ordinary people. And from uh, the tombs of ordinary people, uh, we um, excavated uh, these uh, bone inserts uh, in different parts of uh, uh, the bow and arrow. So in uh, this way, seven different uh, pieces of uh, bone have been found. Uh, and it is typical of the Huns that uh, um, the bow is not symmetrical, that one arm is always longer. So one arm is 40 centimeters, for instance, and the other one is 25 centimeters. So there is a difference of 15 centimeters between the two arms. So this is the main uh, property of uh, Hanik uh, bone, uh, bows. And uh, we 
uh, understand uh, that these asymmetrical bows were only used by the Huns. And uh, we have uh, excavated similar uh, finds in uh, lots of uh, Hunnic graves. Unfortunately, all the wood uh, decayed, and it is just the bone fragments uh, that we can find now. And the researchers think that these asymmetrical bows were used by horsemen. That's the assumption. And there is uh, still uh, another part uh, of uh, relics representing Hunnic uh, uh, arrow uh, tips. And uh, um, it is written down in written forces that uh, um, they used uh, these tips because they gave out a whistling sound, which uh, is uh, another uh, feature of the Hunnic bows and arrows. And if we uh, find any such relics uh, in Europe, then uh, certainly um, that comes from the Hunnic era. And another important uh, part, well, uh, based on the uh, most recent uh, examination from Mongolia, uh, we um, excavated about 100 uh, um, graves uh, in rocks, it, it, uh, they come from a period from the 6th to the 8th century. And in these uh, graves, uh, there was a natural um, cool temperature. And this is how the relics uh, could be preserved. And that's how uh, we found uh, these uh, bows and arrows in a good condition. So that comes from Western uh, Mongolia, uh, from Jarkalan Karkin. Uh, from a rock uh, grave, and uh, you can uh, here see that uh, the um, parts uh, uh, are uh, almost of the same length, and that they had to hold the bow in the middle. Unfortunately, in this photo, you cannot really clearly see this. However, You can uh, still see the borderline when uh, the bone and uh, the, um, the the bone uh, and the wood were glued, and sometimes they also used the, the horns of animals. And they also uh, used the gums of animals as uh, a layer. This uh, is uh, uh, from the 12th to 13th uh, century, um, and also from a grave in um, a cave. And here you can see the proportions as well. So this is uh, a relic from central Mongolia. And it shows that the inner part of the bow was uh, uh, fitted, uh, that it comprises five parts, uh, the wings, then the arm, and uh, where uh, people had to hold it in the middle, so five parts. But of course, um, um, there was a variety region by region. And uh, at some places, uh, uh, the middle part uh, is made of one piece, but usually it's five pieces. Anyway, uh, this comes uh, from the 14th century. And uh, uh, that also comes from a uh, burial site in the rocks. So uh, you can see the ornamentation uh, also, and there is an additional um, layer of uh, uh, bark. And the external brown layer is the bark of some fruit tree. 
And this uh, picture, something which uh, we know very well, uh, it was um, uh, made, a painting made in the 13th century, and this uh, depicts uh, Mongolian uh, bow uh, men, how they use the bow. And uh, in the earlier picture, we had it from Jargalan Mountain, and here we've got a very similar bow to that. And the same type of uh, uh, bow came up from the Altai mountain as well. You can see uh, that uh, this bow is very similar to the previous ones. And in this uh, bow, uh, there are uh, ornamentations that you also can see clearly. So today, um, uh, Mongolians are still using this type of bow. And uh, the experts uh, say that this is a Manju bow. But I don't think this is correct. It should uh, be called a bow uh, originating in the Manju era. Uh, so the outer uh, layer is uh, horn. And it doesn't mean that the, uh, it was the Manjus who invented this type of bow, but uh, they uh, are uh, using this type of bow uh, that has been passed down to them. So the use of this bow is the following. If uh, it is a little bit injured and if it is not symmetrical, uh, then uh, its use is going to be a little bit uh, harmful to human body. And I don't think this should be used uh, for tournaments, for instance. And what uh, uh, bow relics uh, have been excavated in the territory of Hungary. So here I'd like to compare them. And uh, we would like to continue our research with uh, that help. And we'd like to continue the examination to see how the uh, bow managed to find its way here to Europe. Thank you very much for your attention. This uh, is uh, now a video uh, image. You here can uh, hear uh, how the Hanik uh, arrow whistles. It can uh, be heard very easily. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation. And I wish uh, him a lot of success for this research with the Hungarian bows uh, because uh, you can give us some new information. And now let's uh, uh, talk uh, about uh, uh, fight. And I would like to give the floor to Dr. Taba Hidan. And uh, he himself uh, works at this university. So I'd like to ask him uh, to speak uh, about the Hanik uh, weapons of puncture and cutting. Thank you. I would like to welcome you all. And first and foremost, I uh, would like to say th thanks for the Magyarság uh, Kutató Institute for organizing this conference. I think this is filling a gap, because even if I just uh, think of my own career, there has been no uh, conference, home conference, that would have uh, 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 research this uh, period so intensely. I have been involved in the archaeology of this period of time, and that is why I wear this traditional gown. 
and uh, because I think it is interesting, I think in a good sense, the uh, search for a quest for tradition is actually uh, is uh, going to uh, formulate our mindset, and if uh, po proper, then it is also urging us to co protect our country. I learned a lot yesterday, and it also has reassured some of my assumptions that I had started examining from a different perspective, because uh, actually the archaeogenetic, and now the archaeogenetic results that uh, was that were reported yesterday have reinforced this um, statement of mine. I'm sure that we are at a good path, uh, although we uh, direct from uh, we come from two directions, but it's good to come to the same conclusion. I would like to start my presentation by Herodotus. In his fourth book, it says that the Scythians, although they do not live in the same country, do not speak the same language, still they can tell the difference from whether certain peoples are Scythians or not. So we all descend from the same blood, we Mongolians and the Hungarians. We are not a small country, although we do not speak the same language, we do not uh, live in the same country. But according to Herodotus and also the archaeological research, we all are the descendants of Huns, so we are from the same blood. It's not a small people in the Germanic uh, uh, tribes, uh, but no, rather, we are a big nation. We are a great nation from the Altai to the Chinese um, uh, wall, there are all related uh, nations, nations or peoples who are relative. So, and this is a fifth century European or East European Han armory that I'm wearing now. It is, of course, more simple, simpler than an aristocrat, Hun aristocrat would be wearing, but I made most of it myself. The cap the uh, shield, uh, but actually the weapons are made by a um, locksmith on, I have a felt uh, fur hat and the cicada, the cicada, which it gives a rank. And my body is protected by a uh, scale um, armor and some scaled armor based on the, on the iron armor. I made this uh, leather one. In the settler land, I uh, uh, sew this uh, from felt and an ethnographic ethnographer called my attention what material to use. I have an Eastern uh, uh, trousers and I have a boot uh, with uh, clip, cl clips sometimes. Uh, they were mounts with the gold uh, as well. It is made of leather, my boots. But I have this puncturing and cutting uh, Swords, Yakushovice uh, and Panonhalmi sword is uh, with the scabbard uh, and with an amulet. This is a straight uh, sword. And from Sirma Besenyő Kolozsvár Kardos, I have the 61 centimeter long medium size or short sword, if you like. And my uh, knife is a simple with a wooden uh, hold. Yesterday, uh, one of the pictures that Erdem Bator professor showed me, uh, they, you could see this uh, kind of cup and and also a felt uh, bag. And in uh, my hand, there is a whip 
So without this uh, nomad from the steppe would not get out of his yurta. Hans uh, were uh, nomad uh, steppe peoples and the creators of this culture, and they also conveyed this culture. Let's not forget that there are a lot of technical innovations, like the tailored uh, suit, the tailored, uh, and like the saber, the long, uh, uh, the long sword, the. Uh, uh, the and and many other things that were not only revolutionizing the military or the warfare but also the everyday life of the people because it's not only me but also you are wearing Scythian uh, uh, Scythian type of uh, clothes because the others were just having a kind of uh, a veil uh, that were uh, forced together by a fibula, but they were not uh, aware of the tailored uh, uh, suit. So one was from Olon Huring, the first pants in the history of human mankind. But we could also talk about the uh, some other dresses, like in Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and in China. These were discovered, and they were all tailored uh, clothes. If it did not happen, if the nomadic did not convey this culture all over the world, how unpleasant it would be just to have uh, kind of uh, uh, just uh, to to have uh, uh, many t d d like uh, n nothing special. Just imagine that these people were riding from Mongolia to the Adriatic Sea, and there were some Eastern armies uh, who were defeating. Uh, uh, the nations uh, in the uh, Eastern Europe, in the Western Europe, and uh, backwards has never happened. Like just think of Napoleon's army. The other direction, however, up to Adriatic Sea or the middle of France, uh, like Bayans Avars uh, defeated uh, Frank's uh, King Sigbert, Sigbert in the today's territory of France. By today, it is a cultural racist uh, attitude that these uh, steppe nomads take over everything from those nations that are settled down. This sounds as if uh, they were taking over everything from the Merovingian, from the Chinese, or from the Byzantine. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, these are written in some textbooks as well, although it's a mistake. It was two months ago at our scientific trip to Mongolia, I was listening about the iron melting furnaces on um, the some Mongolian riverbanks, but it was not a Chinese one, but this was a furnace type, which was quite similar of the Hungarians. And if you look at the order by Byzantine Emperor Mauritius, he said that the cavalry's uh, wear should be tailored so that it should be tied on the waist so that it should look uh, hand so the wearer should look handsome and while riding it should cover the knee he also added that uh, cavalry should have uh, iron stirrups two iron stirrups with a saddle and they should also have some collars but if we start back from time, Xin Shi Huan Tu, the Yellow Emperor, ordered that the, the Chinese cavalry should wear some tailored garments. They should have some belts, and they should also learn how to use the bow from um, when mounted. And the ranks uh, until 1911, of course, with a lot of modification, though. But all these ranks uh, of some. Honic uh, origin were still in, still valid until uh, 1911. So, 
This was a tradition for over or over 2,000 years. If we bear all this in mind, we shall not wonder why the cavalry warfare was an elite warfare and was able to survive several uh, military historical periods. So the mounted uh, archers were fighting against the various Germanic tribes. And then AD, uh, when in Western Europe the heavy cavalry is developing against them, we Hungarians or Cumans uh, uh, or Huns uh, are quite successful. Like in uh, 1241, the Lignitz uh, battle, well, the Teuton uh, are uh, fighting against Baidar and Orden. They actually defeat the Polish heavy cavalry and uh, Teuton Knights Order. But when the heavy cavalry is over, then artillery will uh, uh, develop because in uh, Western Europe in 50 years uh, uh, time it absolutely disappears but the steppe nomadic horsemen are able to uh, embed into his uh, military attitude or style various uh, revolvers and guns as well but the style remains. Uh, these are no quotes from a chronicle. It is like a running away as if to outsmart the enemy and then returning to defeat him. And this is a secret for hundreds of years. This is the secret of the steppe warfare style that they adjust to the morphological um, features and um, the climate and everything, and their best weapon is riding. Logistically speaking, we made some uh, experiments in the outskirts of Budapest uh, on foot, on horseback, with the uh, armor and, 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 and without it. The distance was 1,600 meters. The 1,600 meter had a, a moor uh, site. Uh, an area with some elevation and an upper uh, land. We were three different types of uh, arm, armory, and we covered this between three minutes and 16 seconds and, uh, uh, and uh, three minutes and 40 seconds. But uh, on foot, we did it between 16 to 20 minutes. But, you know, the difference was that when we did uh, uh, that, uh, after three minutes, the horse was still in his elements. But when, after 16 or 20 minutes, we were absolutely out of breath, and we could not have, uh, could not have uh, fought at all. For a horse, however, 1,600 meters is nothing. So just think about it, logistically speaking, what a steppe horse would mean. The steppe horse will not get sick, will not get tired. It eats only grass. And they can also overcome uh, the difficulties of various uh, mounts and rivers. Uh, even River Danube, which, and even some great rivers as well. But the life of the nomadic cavalry is passing so that they are always in uh, fighting for and against their animals. And uh, why, before the Greens now would attack this, I would like to re. Uh, explain. So uh, a nomadic steppe uh, warrior must protect uh, his animals from the animals of the steppe, from uh, burglars and also from the looting soldiers. So he is uh, fighting for his an animals and against his animals. Just imagine when 300 horses must be herded to the uh, drinking place or the semi-wild herd when it has to be separated into two groups. And just imagine a stud to cut into two parts, divert them, 
and encircle them by some other horses. This is like a military action. This is just like they have to do with the enemy. These all are military features. And just one more thing, because if when a gardener is um, is uh, digging in the garden, watering the cabbage or the tomato, he straightens up and uh, and uh, rests a little bit, but. Uh, uh, vegetables are not as wild as animals. So if you go to the semi-wild stud or a semi-wild herd, you have to keep a keen eye on the animals in order to prevent being uh, um, uh, being um, um, damaged or or injured. If someone is able to overcome a semi-wild bull or or a cow then is able to fight very fiercely. Although the bow was the most important weapon, the previous presentation showed the, uh, uh, the stiff or the rigid type of bow, let alone the uh, long uh, the long sword, like Tugas can alter boy, Carmine board, these are all longer than one meter. But such a step uh, uh, horseman, nomadic invention was the uh, saber, the brute sword, and also the uh, mace. Uh, about two months ago, we had some experiments made with some armor, armory shirts. And after five or six beats, it could uh, tear out six or seven uh, beads, despite the fact that it has no uh, sharp edge. All the uh, or not, none of none of the swords had a scabbard. This is something that you know. It's a Bronze Age basic type. You can beat rather than cut with it because uh, you cannot use your wrist. So you rather either point or you just uh, cut. So when fencing, even if uh, the person protects, then the other party's sword will just uh, fall down. So the warrior will lose all his fingers. So this uh, kind of uh, uh, shape would allow this and it is the so this kind of uh, shape sh sharp is the one that um, is uh, is uh, so uh, essential uh, the we know only four swords like this, but the way it spread in uh, Eurasia, it spread by the Huns and the Vassal German peoples take over from them. With the Huns, there are lots of lots of other swords as well, and it's quite interesting because the ones without the shape, they all are the ones that you can use with two of your hands. Like this one, for example. So Turayevo is in Eastern uh, Europe. It's a uh, Tataristan, and it is it's uh, grip is twenty four centimeters, and the and the crossword, the lack of crossword is a cross guard is uh, missing.
Nekem te... So these are the nine basic types used by the Huns. These are the most widespread. The first one, which is long, straight, double-edged, uh, with a um, and and with a simple grip, like the one with Sirma Beshenyu, which is 94, uh, 97 meters uh, long, but also the one uh, Yakutsovice and the one at Kazakhland, 85, the Jamatogai. And let me highlight that one is from the Kazakhland, the other is uh, Poland. Uh, and the third is Carpathian Basin. So both with the Asian and the European horns, this can be found. Next to it, they have the very typical or short sword. This is uh, the one from Sirma Besenyu, 55 centimeters long, but the Fedorovka finding it has the 61 centimeters or medium size. Sometimes they are all equipped with the long and short sword. They could only wear it on the right side, and this is how they used it. Let me show it from the other side. So we can imagine what kind of advantage it was if uh, against a, a German or Roman warrior without a cross guard. But the most uh, exquisite and most efficient one, which was a mounted golden decoration and uh, semi gems or uh, glass space was put in, such as, for example, Holm Shapkino, or in Hungary, Pannonhalma, or Bátaszék. The Hungarian swords are 107 meters, the Pannonhalmi, and 96, the Bátaszék long one is uh, 97. So the Huns have Probably their simplest uh, sword, sometimes with single or double edge, like the one at Lébény, or the Kizil Karnai Töbej. And one of them from are from the Carpathian Basin, and the second is uh, the... Uh, so the easternmost one, is the Tugozvonovo from the Altai Mountains. This is 110 centimeters uh, long, with uh, there were two uh, other uh, warfare weapons. Uh, there were three which were found in the graves. This is a uh, the Torevo copy, 106 centimeters, and the grip is 24 centimeters. So this is like the original. Tataristan, it's from Tataristan. So this sword, uh, this, uh, the simple copy of that is that of uh, the Turai. And something that we have already heard uh, from the um, American speaker, that we have certain uh, uh, weapons that the Huns give to their German vassals. We know the eastern and the western parallel to it as well. 
So this is like a saber sword. This is like the Kerch Linische 91 uh, centimeters single single blade, and the Puan in France, the Hun Vazas uh, grave, and the Caucasians Malchiki sword sable. It is 91 and 64 centimeters long. These are the ones I'm talking to you about. But whatever is missing from the gra graves of the Huns, but you can find it in the Alans uh, graves, it is this one. I have not, uh, I could not find out what, uh, what this was used for. And we have the military Jamato guy, it's from Kazakh land. Uh, this is where we found it. This is a um, military knife. And now we can see the pictures of the various basic types. So we can see the Malchiki sword, uh, saber sword. And we can also see that the Malchiki has a similarly, a pommel similarly to the Puan one. We can also see that uh, we have a two-hand uh, sword from the Caucasian mountains from Georgia, 24 centimeters, and the grip is gold with one element in decoration. And we can see that this is not having any grip either, but it is for two hands. And next to it, we can see the sword that has uh, uh, the uh, cross guard and the pattern of the cross, cross guard. And this is the Pannonhalm sword. It is double, uh, double edged uh, with a cross guard and uh, one uh, nail and both the scabbard was uh, decorated with a scale or lamel armor. And here we can see a reconstruction drawing of a Han uh, a warrior and a noble woman. And finally, I would like to share with you that maybe there is one single explanation for these uh, swords without cross guards. And yesterday's two archaeogenetic presentation reinforced me in this uh, thinking. If you read Tacit, we can see uh, that after the death of uh, Emperor Nero, uh, the sarmatan roxoran War breaks out, and he writes down that against the uh, uh, against their attack, the uh, Romans are unable to def to protect themselves unless it is uh, very snowy or muddy because then the horses would be slipping. And why? Because uh, uh, these uh, uh, people are taking uh, hold of uh, their weapons, which are very important for us, with two hands. So they do not even protect them by a shield. So it is obvious that those who are using the both hands for keeping the sword would not use a shield. So this is the Sarmatha and Roxalan heritage with the Huns. And yesterday, it was a very, very 
impressive uh, in and and vis visible when the uh, when there were those yellow and and green circles. This is something that I can tell you about the Hun source that it can be detected how they became one nation, how they became one single nation, the various tribes and the various peoples, and the final final result is and the same thing which I where I concluded to that in the Carpathian bases when the Western uh, group or the clan of the Huns would establish uh, uh, a land, well, these all include those genes of Inner Asia and also the Sarmata area. And finally, let me say a few words about the sword cult of the Huns. We can see a little uh, a uh, little thing at the end, which is made of uh, copper and a semi, uh, semi precious stone. These are all east from the Carpathian basis. This is just like an amulet. This was not the pommel. This was just hanging. Uh, uh, there was, there's always a loop uh, that. Uh, But we know that the Hun origin of the Arpad is reinforced by the fact that the uh, Arpad was also using this. And Lambert Herzfeld, in his Annales Lambertini, in 1071, that is the 11th century, and this again reinforces uh, the presentation that we heard about the uh, Han identity of the Arpad house. So this German monk said in 1063, um, the widow of uh, Andras I, Anastasia, donated from the Arpad treasury the famous sword of Attila, the sword that the great king of the Huns received from the gods so that he could uh, all defeat the hostile nations. And this uh, saber that Anastasia donated as a gift. This is a pre-conquest uh, uh, weapon. But the fact that uh, the Arpad house considers that this is from Attila, this reinforces the Arpad house's uh, identity with the Huns. How much it's true or not, this kind of magical power that's attached to this sword. So uh, he could not uh, keep it. Uh, he gave it to Daddy, uh, Count Daddy, but he was soon uh, killed. He also gave it to further down. And then this person also gave it to Leopold Merzeburg, who was also killed soon. So finally, it got back to the treasury up to 1440, up to the coronation of Frederick uh, III. This is the German Roman coronation weapon, although the Germans had no cult of uh uh, of, uh, of 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 cult of uh, swords, their uh, cultic uh, thing was uh, the, uh, the spear, the lance. And it is the case of Shimon who writes about the sword uh, cult, but we know the Alanians had a sword cult, and we also know the story of Attila the Great when the heifer, when the calf hurts its. Uh, when the half, uh, the calf hurts its leg, uh, they go to Attila, and then the shaman says that this can only be the sword of the god, which uh, nobody else can have but Attila, the great. And the sword simply came out of the earth, and Attila took it and uh, and points it out to the skies, and the horn, the horns, uh, uh, shouted out. Uh, uh, be blessed, be blessed, be blessed. The various faiths and beliefs into the various uh, weapons was imagined always differently by people. Sometimes they uh, they literally believed this. Sometimes they thought it was just a symbol. No matter what, the given community received uh, uh, faith and power in some uh, times of calamities, just as if uh, there was a real life hero 
uh, going between them with a real sword which had a magical power. Thank you very much, uh, Dan, uh, for this um, presentation on puncture and cutting weapons. Well, we were not perfect in our organization, but I'd like to have another presentation now about mates, but we won't have it because we couldn't organize it. Instead, I'd like to ask Laszlo Moratz from the University of Amsterdam to deliver his presentation on the heritage of the Huns and their role in uh, global history. So it is near to impossible to have this whole topic in 20 minutes instead of a whole day. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, first of all, I, um, I would like to thank the uh, Institute for Hungarian Research uh, to invite me to this uh, conference. Unfortunately, uh, I could not be present uh, in person this week in uh, Budapest. So it's a pity that I cannot join you on the spot because uh, I think the, um, the conference itself is very important and I think there are a lot of interesting uh, presentations on the culture and uh, the heritage of the Huns. Um, I will have a very modest contribution to this, con uh, to this um, conference. So I will say some words about the the role of the Huns in world history. Um, so if you want to study um, the, uh, the role of uh, the Huns in uh, world history, you have to collect images and stereotypes of, uh, of the Huns. As you know, um, uh, history writing, the, his the science of history, is very much dominated by the Western world especially, I think, in the 20th century. So it is very important to, um, to collect all those images and stereotypes that have been published throughout history, but also especially in the 20th century about the Huns and uh, affiliated uh, peoples and, and tribes and nomads. Now, what is striking about the Western images and stereotypes of the Huns is that they are very, very negative. So normally, um, when you collect stereotypes of, um, of a country or a, a continent or whatever, you quite often find, uh, let's say, a change between negative and positive values. So, for example, uh, Western stereotypes of the Hungarians can be classified in two patterns. You either have positive stereotypes, like, uh, uh, for example, uh, Sint Stefan, uh, who is uh, depicted as a very brave and a very uh, wise king in, in the Western tradition. Uh, the same with the Hungarian uprising of 1956, which is a very, has a very positive depiction in the Western uh, history writing. But you also have other periods of Hungarian history that are more depicted as a negative uh, experience, where you have negative heroes. Take, for example, uh, the Transylvanian princes like uh, Pukuli or Betlem, Bochkai, they 
quite often have been uh, depicted as negative heroes in uh, Western history writing. Um, but <laughs> with the Huns, we only see negative stereotypes and images. There are no positive images of, um, of the Huns. And um, the 20th century Western history writing is no exception to this. So the question is, um, why are the stereotypes of the Huns so negative in Western history writing? writing? Um, all of the speakers in this conference uh, emphasis the, the unique culture of the Huns and related uh, nomadic horse people in Central Asia and in the steppe territories. Uh, the, the beautiful ornaments uh, they made from uh, also from from golden uh, from golden objects and artifacts. So uh, there is so much positive about the, the heritage of the Huns, but we don't get any information on that. We only see the negative uh, stereotyping. So basically, these negative stereotypes have two patterns. So one of them is the Huns as barbarians, so uncivilized people. And um, there are a lot of vari vari variants to this, but that is the main pattern. And then we have, uh, of course, Attila as the scourge of God. So in uh, Latin, the flagellum Dei. Um, so basically, these are the, the two patterns of uh, the Han stereotypes in the Western literature and history writing. So there is a long list of uh, Western authors that use these uh, images, this pattern I sketched, Marcellinus, Jordanus, uh, Saint Jerome, one of the church fathers, Herodotus, it, he was already mentioned, in one of these previous uh, lectures, um, we find this pattern in the humanist period, the Renaissance. We find it in the Enlightenment with, uh, with uh, authors like uh, Gibbon, uh, his very well-known book about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, and so on and so forth. And this only uh, also is the dominating pattern in the 20th century with writers like Mackinder, I will uh, come back to him uh, in a few minutes in more details, but also, for example, Carol Quigley, who was um, a professor at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and was the mentor of uh, former President Bill Clinton. So in his book on the evaluation of civilizations, is explicitly very negative about the Huns and the horse people that live in Central Asia and their contribution to world history. So the question is, why is this pattern of the Huns in the Western images, the Western stereotypes, so negative? And why are there no any positive images? related to the Huns. Um, if we look at the Hungarian chronicles, we see a completely different, um, uh, a different uh, pattern. It was already mentioned uh, by, uh, in a previous uh, lecture today. So the Hungarian chronicles, um, for example, the Gesta Hungarorum, uh, written by Anonymous um, at the end of the 12th and the beginning of the 13th century, and a number of other gestas, and also the Tahiri Ungerus, this, um, this codex that has been uh, discovered by, by uh, Ar Arminius Vanberi uh, in, uh, in Istanbul at the market, which turned out to be a Hungarian uh, a, um, a text on a Hungarian gesta that was uh, published in Turkish in the beginning of the 16th century after the defeat of the Hungarian royal army at Mohács. 
So in the Hungarian, in this tradition of the Gestas and the Hungarian um, Codex, we find continuity between, let's say, the Scythian, the Huns, uh, the Avars, um, and the Hungarians, the Magyars, um, as uh, people, nomadic, horse-riding people, who started their uh, appearance in history somewhere in Central Asia. Um, so the continuin continuity is there, and also the Hungarian uh, Hun kinship, as was also mentioned in the previous lecture on the codexes and the guest art. So in the Hungarian tradition, uh, we find a completely different pattern. Um, the Hun heritage is represented much more positively. It cannot be compared actually to the, uh, to the Western uh, tradition of these very negative images and stereotypes. But in Hungary, in the second half of the 19th century, uh, the Hungarian chronicles itself were put aside. And Hungarian history writing followed a uh, German pattern, which was basically started in the 18th century by Schlösser, uh, who was a uh, German Enlightenment historian. And later, um, it, this tradition was uh, continued by Robert Roth, an also uh, German historian. And basically, this tradition wants to Indo-Europeanize the steppe. And of course, when you Indo-Europeanize the steppes, then of course, the nomadic horse people that speak languages that are not of Indo-European origin, uh, they basically form an obstacle. So you, get, you want to get rid of them and you push them to, to the north. Because of course, in the south, we also have Indo-European people like uh, in India and in Persia. So that's why uh, the Hungarian heritage ended up in the, in the northern part uh, of Eurasia. And um, there, there was a Hungarian tradition, history writing tradition, which is uh, also dominating at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences today. And uh, one of these, uh, their leaders was Al Hunfalvi, who followed this, um, this program of the, of the German tradition and wanted to get rid of the nomadic horse riding people being of Scythian, Hunnian, or um, Sarmatian stock. So that's why the Hungarian, uh, Hungarians ended up as a finno ugric people speaking a finno ugric language and having their so-called um, Urheimat in the northern parts of Eurasia. Uh, this tradition was challenged by people like Wambery, uh, I just mentioned, but um, uh, in the end, uh, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences um, uh, went along with this uh, tradition of the finno ugric heritage. Now, of course, um, when you do history writing, you cannot say the Hungarian chronicles are useless, as did uh, Schlusser, as did Robert Russler, and also did Paul Hunfalvi. They simply put away the whole heritage of the chronicles. Now, that's not the way you do historical research. Uh, that's a methodological mistake. What you should do is, of course, do it in a critical fashion. So you need to check the data of the Hungarian uh, Gestas and the Hungarian Chronicles and the Tahiri Ungerus. And if you check them independently and you, you are able to find uh, critical uh, sources, then you can some, say something about whether they represent a true heritage or not. But to say, I don't use any Hungarian gestas, I don't use any Hungarian uh, chronicles, they are useless. The only thing that interests me is a superficial linguistic affinity. That's, of course, 
unacceptable because if we would do this, there would be no history writing because any time you can put aside um, text and um, written sources that are not of interest and do not satisfy your specific view on history. So I only wanted to point out, it was not mentioned by the previous speaker on the codices, is the, the work of Pichak Omelian. In 1905, he published a uh, scientific article, article on the Bulgarian list of princes, and there he unambiguously showed that there is a relation between Attila and the royal house of Arpa. So actually, uh, what Omelian did um, some time ago in recent history was actually to underpin the data that, and the names that were mentioned in the Hungarian chronicles, ex especially the one mentioned in Turozi, uh, which the Gesta of Turozi that was written by the end of the 15th century on behalf of the Hungarian king Matthias Corvinus. Um, okay, so to summarize, and then I go to the final part of my presentation. So we have a very negative uh, images and stereotypes of the Huns in the Western history writing, in the Western tradition of viewing and, per uh, and perception of Central Asia and the steppe land. Um, there is a positive Hungarian heritage that has been basically knocked out of history writing in the second half of the 19th century. So it is extremely uh, difficult, I think, to get a realistic picture of um, the heritage of the Huns, the heritage of the, um, the horse riding nomads from Central Asia and their contribution to world history. Um, so in order to get more insight, I think we need to study uh, geopolitical theory. I think this is very important because um, the, the nomadic people, horse riding people and the camel riding nomads in Central Asia and the steppe land, they actually occupy the, the heartland which is a central concept in the Mackinder type of geopolitical theory. Now, of course, Mackinder is very positive about the contribution of the Huns and other people entering from Central Asia to, um, uh, to, the, to the European domains. But in any case, um, he admits that, um, first of all, the Eurasian heartland was dominated by horse riding and camel riding nomads. Secondly, that European civilization actually developed as a reaction to, those, to the pressure of these people when they um, entered uh, Europe via uh, corridors in the Uralic mount mountain and also in the Caucasus. So uh, European civilization would never have been um, developed if there wouldn't have been uh, constant attacks and constant penetration from the Eurasian heartlands into Europe. And basically, uh, Mackinder admits that these uh, penetrations of the so-called Iranian people, the horse riding and camel riding people, took place between the 5th and the 6th century AD. So you have to think of peoples and tribes like the Huns, the Avars, the Bulgarians, the Magyars, the Khazars, the Pechinaks, the Kumanians, and the Mongols. So this means that um, it will be very important to use a geopolitical framework where you find Europe and Asia together, 
where there is um, continu continuity in time and space, and you will be able to locate the no horse riding people in this framework of time and space on the Eurasian continent, which as you know, is for 4,000 miles, it's about 10,000 kilometers long from the Pusa in Hungary until the very end of Asia in the east. Um, so that also means that um, we have to restudy and reinterpret in interpret the military maneuvers of the Huns. So what is precisely the meaning and the consequence of the battle on the Catalonian plains that took place in 451 AD between uh, the armies of Attila and the Romans led by Aetius and the, and the Gauls, uh, the Gothic uh, army. What is precisely the contribution to world history of the meeting Attila had with Pope Leo in 452 AD? Well, this is an extremely interesting meeting because as you know, Pope Leo was one of the reformers of the Vatican. And um, we have no uh, minutes of this meeting. There are no uh, records. We don't know precisely what Attila and Pope Leo uh, discussed and debated about. But it is very interesting um, to reinterpret interpret these sorts of events that are related to the Huns in terms of this geopolitical framework of Mackinder. And what about uh, Piscos Rhetor, um, a, uh, a Byzantine ambassador who visited the summer camp of Attila in 448, where he heard that the Huns of Attila, in combination with the Eastern Huns, were planning to conquer the world island. The world island, we would say, in terms of Mackinder. And the world island is consisting of Europe, Asia, and Africa, as you know. So, this was already heard in the summer camp that uh, actually uh, Attila was striving for world power by attacking the, the, the West, Europe, and Asia, the eastern parts, uh, Persia, and India at the same time. It should have been a combined attack on the world islands, striving for world hegemony, which was, by the way, later on realized uh, in the 12th century by the Mongols under Genghis Khan. Okay, but these are all things we have to restudy and we need to get away from the negative stereotypes and images of the Han which gives a distorted picture of their heritage and their contributions and their plans to dominate um, the world island in terms of Mackinder. But let me finish with uh, Quickly, uh, Carol Quickly, who is, uh, was one of the most influential professors of Georgetown University and wrote a book on the evaluation of civilizations uh, which is used as a textbook in, in the first year of uh, academic studies in many places in the United States. Well, actually, according to Quigley, a civilization is no civilization when it is not familiar with the writing system and city life. Now, of course, the Huns as barbarians and Attila as the scores uh, of God means that um, in a in a, let's say, an objective analysis of the Huns and related people, you will not find anything about their writing system, neither of the cities they might have built or established. Uh, so that's why um, archaeological findings uh, in on the Eurasian continent related to the Huns are so important because uh, there is a great chance that you will find some heritage of the writing system and also of urban spaces. But we have seen today, also in the previous lecture, 
uh, the stirrups, uh, the horseshoes, the composite bow, all these type of technical innovations in the military domain, they came from the east to the west. So even if uh, Hunt had now established a uh, sophisticated city, li uh, city life, these were so important um, developments in the history, in the global history, that uh, you cannot deny it. And it's very important to recognize them and to study them and to write about it. Uh, that's the, the, the job we as historians have to do. And hopefully uh, we will manage in the 21st century to, to have some positive images and stereotypes in the Western textbooks on history. Okay, that was my modest contribution. And um, I hope uh, um, it could satisfy your intention. And I thank you for being together, even if, it's, uh, if it was on uh, social media. Thank you for your attention. Hölgyeim és uraim, elnézésüket kell kérnem, az előbb hibáztam, amikor azt mondtam, ez lesz az utolsó előadás. Ladies and gentlemen, I um, uh, made a mistake earlier. I thought that uh, this is going to be the last presentation, but we have to adopt to the situation. We have one more presentation also online. Ahmed Glashev from the Institute of Turkology, but Alan's origin relation to Hans and their heritage. So please listen to this presentation. Jó napot kívánok, hölgyeim és uraim, és nagyon köszönöm, hogy meghívtak engem egy ilyen nagyon ö, érdekes konferenciára, és szeretném elkezdeni, elindítani PowerPoint előadásomat. Question also related to history of Alans and Karachay Balkars and other North Caucasian um, nations. Um, slide number four. Um, uh, here you can see important information about how uh, um, the sources on Alans um, may be um, used by different authors and maybe have some uh, manipulations also with the sources. Um, I can say it here. Mm. Next slide. Uh, a few words about the linguistic studies of Mr. Abayev, Professor Vasily Abayev. Uh, uh, that was a prominent Soviet uh, specialist in Iranic languages. He was uh, uh, originally Ossetian and uh, that also affected his uh, studies. Mm. Here on this slide, mm, number five, you can see uh, the examples of his etymologies of Alanic and Sarmatian and Scythian names. And uh, uh, the possible etymology using Turkish languages. Line number six. Also, some example about the facts, how it is used by different authors. Yeah, you can see it. That uh, just in 2019, there was a book, a new book of uh, Moscow archaeologist Dmitry Korobov, who is specialized in history of Alan. And uh, in this book, he totally changes the scientific facts uh, related to Karachay Balkars and Digors and Alans. 
slide number seven. Uh, this is a very interesting information, uh, DNA tests of uh, Caucasian people, Hungarian Yasses, uh, and uh, DNA tests of the remains from Steve Kurgans, uh, Sarmatian Kurgans, uh, and uh, world's graves, and uh, graves of Alanian time. Also, Sunno graves. You can see uh, examples from Sunno graves. That's a very interesting data. Mm, so, uh, it is established today that uh, DNA uh, R1A Z1 Z21, 23 is very common among skiffs and it is also often among Alans and Sarmats. Yeah, you can see. And Karachay Balkars has have it uh, in more than 36 cases, as you can see it here in this chart. Let's go ahead. Alan language. Do we really have any Alan texts? I am sure that uh, uh, today we don't have any text which may be related to Alans. But we have only personal names, uh, names of the places and uh, some titles. And these uh, titles like uh, Bogatyr, Kerkondaj, they are uh, Turkish. And most of the names of Alans are also Turkish. So, I shortly describe the main so-called Alan texts, which are in fact not Alan texts, and uh, some of them even uh, not find still. Found and uh, we don't have, we don't know if they exist. Number nine, uh, this is a very interesting uh, um, catacomb, Alan catacomb number 118, um, with typical Turkic uh, ritual with the horse. It's in Zaragish village in Kabardino Balkaria. Also, dagger and the knife from the same catacomb. Among Alans, as among Huns, artificial deformation of skulls was used and it was practiced very widely. Here you can see some examples from Karachay, Balkaria, and in the middle, very famous so called Tugazvonovsky Knyaz, Tugazvonov. To was one of a noble man on Ob River in Siberia. Uh, actually, we have some uh, interesting uh, sources, antique sources. For example, Sidonium, which which says uh, that uh, Sirax, the Sarmatian tribe. Uh, gave the power to people with a very very long head or very high man. That's very interesting because if we speak of uh, Shipova burials and cemetery, uh, which some authors uh, think it is Alanic or uh, other authors, they consider it as a Hunnic uh, cemetery, uh, about 85% of uh, skeletons there, they have height more than 185. And uh, the deformation of school is more than 70% in this cemetery. It's interesting if we compare it with uh, this antique source. Slide number 12. 
This is a very interesting and probably the most interesting uh, so-called Huni cauldron. I would like to make this cauldron really the most famous one because it was found in 1986 in a village called Habaz in Balkaria by Professor Miziev. And uh, probably this one is the highest finding of cauldron, Huni cauldron, because it was found uh, on the height 2,000, more than 2,000 meters above the sea level, just near to Elbrus Mount. But the uh, interesting thing is that the other findings of this grave were typical Alanic. So it was, we can say that it was cemetery uh, which belonged to Alans. And uh, the other findings were uh, very rich. And this grave was a grave of a very rich and noble man. And in, 1940, in 1994, uh, the book of Zasetska, a famous Russian specialist in Hunnic culture, was published in Moscow in 1994. And uh, Sasetska um, published all Hunnic cauldrons found from Hungary to uh, Siberia. But you cannot find in this book this cauldron. And it's strange. I don't know why. Probably the intrigue is that the, this cauldron was found in typical Alanic catacomb. But this one was not published. File number 13. Uh, this is a helmet found in Kishpek Kurgans. And according to uh, Professor Betrozov, who found it and discovered this Kurgans, uh, this, uh, belonged, uh, this helmet belonged to Sabirs. This is some maps, slide number 14, 15. Also, uh, it is important to say that uh, in Alan uh, Fortress Humara, there are a lot of uh, Turkic runic inscriptions. Slide 16, comparison of Saltao Mayaki inscriptions with uh, Humara inscriptions. Next one. Monumental uh, art of Alans is definitely related to the same of all Turkic arts in South Siberia, as you can see it from here. Slide number 17. Also some religion facts of Alans and Turks, you can see. Amulets, slide number 18, 19. This is a very good example of belts of ancient Turks and Balkars. You can see how the old Turkic traditions preserved in 19th century among Balkars. Heritage of Alans, a few words. Uh, the name Alan or As is well preserved in the Russian art sagas and in the nowadays life of Karachais and Balkars. In the Karachai Balkar art sagas, uh, the names As and Alan is used frequently. And Karachais call each other when addressed to somebody, uh, Alan, listen to me. Alan La, Alans. This is very common in Karachai Balkars. No any other Caucasian nation preserved such address to each other. Alan. This is a unique uh, fact from the culture of Karachais and Balkars. Uh, the interesting thing again that uh, today uh, Balkars call their neighbors Ossetians Digor, only Digor. And Ossetians called their neighbors us. Balkars called us. And Balkaria is called Asia. 
Karachai is called Stur Asiak, the Great Asia. Karachai Balkar language also preserved the uh, so called the legend of Attila's dagger. As you can see here, Karachai Balkars and say, hey, Haydan Chukpin, Halger Hansan Chukpancha, where do you come from? Unexpectedly, like the old dagger from the grass. Swans who are living in um, Georgia, they call Karachay Balkar Savior or Sabirs. In Digoria Setia, there is a gorge called Savirikom, and some places, name of the places, uh, called Sabir or Saviri. Slide number 21. I will stress your attention also uh, to history of the Caucasian Albanians by Moses the Schurance about Caucasian Huns religion. And these facts uh, preserved in this source, they are also preserved still in the culture of Karachais and Balkars, as you can see from this slide, number 21. Twenty-two. The question, how uh, Ossetians became Iranic-speaking uh, nation, if Alans have Turkic origin or Turkish origin, and their cultures related closely to Huns, as we could see from these uh, materials. Uh, and the question is, whom they are descendant. I think uh, Ossetians descended uh, from uh, Caucasian tribes, Caucasian nations, uh, who were the part of all Georgian nation. And uh, in 6th or 7th or 9th century, uh, they uh, were affected by Sassanid culture. And here, on uh, slide number 22, you can see mm, the evidence of this. So-called Sassanid gems and coins, which we find a lot of them in North Ossetia and South Ossetia. There are not so many gems or uh, coins and other places of the Northern Caucasus. And actually there is no any gems, Sassanid gems in Balkaria or Karachai. But in Ossetia, we can find a lot of them. Uh, this is a, a confirmation that the uh, Sassanid Empire uh, built up not only fortresses, but also uh, they tried to spread their culture in this region. And I think uh, this is the result of uh, mixed language of Ossetians, Caucasian Iranic language. By the way, uh, Miller and uh, Abayev, uh, they always said that and wrote in their books uh, that uh, we cannot say that uh, the language of Ossetians is 100% Iranic. It is mixed language, Caucasian Iranic language. And this is the evidence of this. I try to be very short and uh, to uh, present the key facts, the main facts. Uh, what should I say as a conclusion? Uh, the culture of Alans and uh, Huns, this is one culture and we should consider it as a uh, homogeneous uh, culture, one culture and uh, from Pannonia to Ural and to Caucasus and consider it as a culture of steppes, culture of Alans, Sarmats, Huns, Bulgars, and so-called polychromic style or Clausonet style uh, was, uh, in my opinion, uh, created in Kuban region, in the Caucasus and Azov region. And after that, it's it spread uh, to other regions of Europe. Uh, and the m most important uh, thing, uh, most 
attention should be paying uh, should be paid to problem of so-called Huni cauldrons. It is obvious that Huni cauldrons uh, are like a markers of this culture. I will also present shortly two books. This is uh, the book of uh, Mr. Zakharov, a prominent Russian historian scientist, uh, who is first time in our story history. Uh, Zakharov I would like also present my book, which was published in 2020 on Alans and Asses, and uh, here you can find a lot of interesting information about what I said and tried to explain. Thank you. should speak up but after that it is really very difficult because there's a sentence Liber generationus um, there is a, a Syrian translation uh, which says that the Alans uh, also belong to the peoples uh, with a written structure, but we haven't had any source before, so I have now understood it a little bit. So at, uh, we've come to the end of the presentations, and now I would like to ask uh, uh, Director General Gabor Horvat Lugosi uh, to close uh, the conference uh, with a closing address. Thank you very much. So we have come to the conference of two days. We've heard 21 presentations from seven countries, uh, from uh, uh, the uh, best and most active uh, researchers uh, on the hunt. So I'd like to thank uh, to the uh, Mongolian, Turkish, and um, American delegations for their presence, and thanks uh, to our colleagues who joined us from the Netherlands, Russia, South Korea, and Australia. We Hungarians uh, uh, also uh, made some presentations, and uh, thus we could prove uh, that uh, we are worthy uh, ancestors of the Huns. They still live in us, just like in any uh, other affiliated people who have come to us. Um, and. Uh, um, the three very important purposes and results of the conference can be summarized in the following. Uh, to remind ourselves of the thoughts of Professor Dr. Miklos Kasler, Minister, in our chronicles, uh, there is a, a tradition uh, that uh, the uh, Turul uh, clan uh, descends from the Huns, and we've heard that uh, this is underpinned in chronicles, but also in scientific uh, literature. So um, this conference uh, with the representatives of seven countries uh, certainly uh, contributed uh, uh, to a stronger uh, joint activity between the researchers of the world. And I think that this has just not just been a scientific conference, but a point of uh, connection where um, it has become clear to all of us that we can rely on each other and we could hear uh, interesting new results. For me, it was also very good that uh, this conference was organized in such a way that it was not just uh, uh, about 20 people listening, uh, but about tens of thousands of people, because I think that we should not monopolize the past. Uh, the past uh, shall not be uh, the treasure of researchers earlier kept between moldy wars and now repackaged. Our past, our national heritage, belongs to all of us. And uh, we share our history of thousands of years uh, with the citizens of other countries. So this uh, uh, was also a good 
uh, reply to that question. And thank you very much for having come to us uh, from all over the world. So this is the uh, common past we have to think over. And uh, uh, this uh, is how we should uh, uh, look at other citizens of other countries. It may also be important that uh, this world uh, today, which is global, is not going in the right uh, direction. Uh, it is overstressed, um, and it does not really uh, treasure real values. And in this world, we can uh, point to other directions and convey good messages. And uh, the example of our Hanik uh, ancestors is such a um, hope. Uh, what did uh, the empire of the Huns uh, mean? Independence, freedom. Um, uh, strengths, uh, unparalleled cultural civilization, and I can continue. Uh, so the history of uh, commemoration uh, was not just with the Huns, because during Attila's life, and especially in Europe, uh, these uh, people were called barbarians. And uh, it uh, uh, was uh, clear uh, when we could see the treasures that that was not true. And after Attila's uh, death, uh, they immediately wanted to push uh, uh, the empire of the Huns into oblivion, which was not really elegant from history. However, this conference today could also prove that the world is still capable of going and turning into the right direction. And there are several researchers in the world who uh, can restore uh, the historic heritage and recognition of the Huns and to place them uh, to their deserved place. It is uh, crucial that these scientific uh, presentations are all based uh, on evidence and are underpinned uh, by material or literary uh, sources. So uh, I think that we have to be very thankful uh, for the presenters of the two days, because they have invested a lot of work into their lectures. They are researching um, and uh, uh, giving account of the facts and statements and results belonging to our ancestors, the Huns. Human uh, memory is rather strange. We still remember our parents, uh, grandparents, and great grandparents, and we visit their graves. And we are also very happy when we can hear uh, medieval, romantic, adventurous, uh, or war related stories. And often we like heroes uh, that we have nothing to do with, it does not be they do not belong to us, and they may not even know them. But I think that the uh, Hungarian uh, people has always been the people of knowledge. And I do believe that that with this conference, we've managed uh, to uh, increase our knowledge on the Hungarian uh, people. We could uh, think back to our ancestors, our uh, own ancestors. And I think that uh, that's why the conference uh, has uh, achieved uh, what it uh, aimed at. I don't think we can do more than this today. And there's another closing sentence. So once again, a big thanks to everybody who uh, has come uh, and made presentations at the conference. I'd like to thank those who um, supported the two days uh, with technology. And uh, thanks uh, to na the National Gallery, uh, the host uh, of the event. So thanks for having this conference. And on that note, now I'm closing this conference. Goodbye, and thank you very much.